Hey guys, what's up? So this website hacker rank, um, it, it's pretty good. I went there. People have asked me, how do I get better at algorithms? How do I get better at maybe some of the questions that might get thrown your way in an interview? Uh, there's several issues that I have with, um, number one, hacker rank is good. Uh, number two though, I think it sucks when you go to a job interview and like they start getting you to whiteboard problems. That's, uh, the, the whole thought just really, really just irks me. I really don't feel like I would do very well under that high stress situation. I'm trying to whiteboard out complex uh, coding problems. However, um, a lot of companies do want you to do that sort of thing. They, uh, I think that in the back of my mind, I, I personally perceive it as like they just want to see how you handle something under a high press, situ a high stress situation, and don't necessarily need to see you like write the perfect code or anything. Um, and I would also guess that when you go into this situation that they don't want you to understand right off how to solve this problem. So if you spend a lot of time practicing fizz buzz or something like that, they're probably not going to ask you fizz buzz because they know that you could just memorize it. And you, I don't think they're getting anything out of that situation. Uh, but a lot of companies, you know, they're, you know they, they do it anyway. So, you know, but that said, companies like, uh, like Hack, Hacker Rank, which is out of California, I believe, you know, they've been created to try to see how well people can stack up against each other uh, in solving complex mathematical problems and uh, you know it's all situated around programming but a lot of the concepts are very very um, math intensive and very thought-provoking and has absolutely nothing to do with your typical web development day so if you're going to be a web developer, for the most part, like I've been doing web development seven years, I look at some of these algorithms on this site and I'm like, yeah, I don't really have to do much of any of that. Um, however, that said, I still think it's very thought provoking to try to practice and um, I, they really are a challenge. But then I, I spent some time on ha Hacker Rank and I actually did like 10 or 11 of the problems and some of the problems that were deemed to be easy, like... I really didn't feel like they were that easy, so I think it made me feel bad because maybe I just, I personally speaking, I don't think I'm all that great with, um, you know, some of these abstract concepts or whatever that I don't have to deal with day in and day out. Uh, but I noticed as I was doing more of them, uh, they became a little bit easier for me. So um, I don't know. I, I, I think that um, you know it's probably just me. Like I, I don't have to do this stuff day to day, and uh, for the most part, I don't even think it's all that fun or even satisfying when I get it. I'm just like, oh, okay, I did that. That was kind of annoying, and I don't normally have to do anything like that. You know, do I, I maybe there's a small sense of accomplishment there, but uh, nothing too major. Now, with Hacker Rank, though, I was thinking, you know, these companies and all these people that are promoting this, this tool and trying to get people to use it, ultimately, they're outsourcing complex problems to other people so a lot of the easier submissions where like 45,000 people have already submitted something or a hundred thousand people you know obviously those situations have been solved time and time again but where does the benefit of somebody who goes out and they solve something that only like five people in the world have been able to solve uh, like wouldn't you want like if you and, and if you do it in a different way you're just basically giving hard-earned uh, extremely valuable information for free. And then, you know, anybody can see on Hacker Rank that you submitted this. Um, companies then could probably try to, you know, maybe seek you out and that could be a benefit of using something like this. Or they could just simply steal your code and, you know, and, and you just solve some sort of major algorithm problem that this company had that its 26,000 associates wouldn't, wasn't able to solve on their own or that, you know, 97% of their associates aren't able to solve. But it doesn't matter because, uh, you know, company B who doesn't have 27,000 associates might only have 10 and maybe those 10 guys aren't nearly as good as, as, as you are. They just took your code as well and they're able to apply it. And maybe they can adapt it in little ways, but they see how you solve it. And I think in a way, everybody's getting better. They're getting you know, stronger as developers. Uh, but who really benefits from this? I mean, Hacker Rank is obviously getting money poured into it, and it's considered to be a relatively expensive platform now. A lot of companies are seeing a lot of value in it, so they're going to start using it. I guess what I'm trying to say is I have a problem putting my blood, sweat, and tears into something and then just having somebody else take it for free. Um, and, and even if it's in, you know, if you could argue that it's for the greater good of humanity, this project, though, from what I've seen, is not something like uh, OpenAI. If you guys have never heard of OpenAI, it's a relatively, you know, fascinating 
um, concept, but here's the, the Wikipedia page on it, but it's created by, you know, Elon Musk and a bunch of other people. And it's got over a billion dollars, I think, already in, in just cash setting aside. And it was just founded, according to Wikipedia, and, uh, or maybe, no, a billion pledged in 2015. When did this thing start? Uh, um, yeah, it looks like assets now, 13 billion. Anyway, I don't know exactly when this thing was started, but there's a lot of different people that are actually – um, using this the, this platform and it's all for the greater good of humanity because we're all trying to you know explore artificial intelligence but uh, as this article cites you know Stephen Hawking has stated that advanced AI uh, could if it has the ability to redesign itself at an ever increasing rate that it, it could be like an unstoppable intelligence explosion it could lead to human extinction which it's kind of like that movie with Johnny Depp it was a really bad movie actually uh, I don't remember what it was called but it was just Johnny Depp just made it, it was like a year or two ago but essentially this, uh, you know, he gets, his brain gets intertwined with a computer and he like becomes like a human living artificial intelligent ma machine and immediately he's asking to be connected to the internet and he's out analyzing stock trends and, you know, just can just swallow up all this data and get smarter and smarter. One of the things that, you know, with one of the major advantages of, of a platform like Facebook or Google or something else, they have so much user content that they have a major la leg up on everybody else just because of the sheer volumes of data that they're able to analyze and parse. Um, that leads to that whole big data and machine learning and stuff. So, um, you know, they have a major unfair advantage now because they're so large and they have so much data that we just provide to them for free. And a lot of you guys commented on the video I just posted yesterday where I was talking about how companies are, are, and websites are removing comments because they pretty much want to censor trolls and stuff like that. But they can also censor their message. Um, and, the, you know, some people had pointed out that, you know, it's, it's unfair that, that people – and, and, you know, people are providing their, their, con their content to these, these websites that are able to then use it and be able to capitalize on it, make money off it, you know. So even like comments is all free data. Um, look at Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is a billion dollar platform. And you have the hard work and blood, sweat and tears of all these programmers that have helped each other. And it, it's become a very, very helpful tool. And like, I think it's great. But who owns all that data? It's, it's essentially owned by Stack Overflow and they can do what they want with it. There may be stipulations in their terms of service that state how they can use it and things like that. But um, like one guy got uh, got really mad. He was a guy that contributed to C, C++ a lot. So he's obviously pretty smart. He was out of Texas, which is a relatively conservative state in the United States. And um, I don't know if the guy's conservative or not, but I'm just saying from you know Texas is typically conservative. And this guy had a score of over like 100,000 when I was viewing this article, but he was upset because the U.S. Supreme Court had just legalized uh, same-sex marriage. So it was a major turning point in American society and politics that no longer you could you know, discriminate against you know, gay couples or whatever for you know, being, uh, getting married to each other and stuff like that. Um, and this guy had a problem with the fact that the, um, the logo for Stack Overflow got changed to – um, you know, the stack overflow popping over, um, you know, the bits of data on the stack that were popping out on a buffer ex overflow or whatever that is, you know, the stack overflow logo, they changed it to the, the rainbow, which is, you know, signifying, uh, you know, I guess the, uh, I'm not sure if it's the entire LGBT community or whatever, but, um, uh, either way, you know, they were celebrating and it turns out one of the stack overflow founders is actually, um, you know, gay himself. And, um, this guy was raising a problem. He's like, look, my profile picture is on your, your website and you guys have this logo that's basically implying that my profile and that my, me as a member of this site, you know, condones and believes in this thing. So obviously he took the contrary opinion, but his whole point was that, look, I've contributed a ton of my, you know, knowledge to your platform to accumulate over a hundred thousand score on mostly C plus plus questions and answers. And then they're able to take his data and do what they want with it. And that was basically their argument. We can do what we want with your data. You provide us the data. It's now ours. So Google is the same thing, but to the extreme. As we search, um, what made Google unique when it was first getting started? Larry Page wasn't even the best programmer, uh, at least not that I know of. When I read uh, in the Plex book, uh, Larry Page was trying to implement his original PageRank algorithm. You know, He found a unique idea that by looking at 
and ranking the values of you know all these websites and then seeing what websites are linking to what and based on that value scale to then determine how relevant content was it was a very unique idea that nobody was really capitalizing on so he's able to take it he tries to write it in java turns out java was like a turd according to this guy something hassan who then takes it and writes it in python so google's entire stack was in python for the longest time and the thing is is the entire premise of google was was one relatively simple idea that was better than um, other people's and, and they were the first ones to actually discover it but since that time is google just this page rank you know uh, search engine that does it better than everybody else i mean hell no google has hundreds if not thousands of different algorithms and it has so much money and scale that it can you know it, it can it, essentially if it wanted to pay humans to sift through this content manually it could do that um, and I, it does that to some extent even back in those days it was doing that to some extent but my point is that you know they're able to capitalize on an idea they become the biggest you know search engine company in the world and now they're one of the biggest if not the biggest data engine by far and now they have access to all this data and it was all freely provided to them uh through their service you know by us and then we don't get to keep it and that raises even more problems like it's like if you go and you you promote your stuff on twitter uh or even my youtube channel right i put in three and a half years yeah three and a half years into this channel and i've done countless videos and stuff like that if you look at the money that this channel makes over the amount of effort that was poured into it it's not even anywhere close to what a programmer would normally make in a regular job and stuff like that. Um, but the thing is, is I enjoy doing it. Uh, as it grows, there is satisfaction in watching it grow and stuff like that. But YouTube and Google could just pull the plug at any moment's notice. And they've done that to other people. And you're not able to then, you know, take your platform and all that work that you've done and stuff. So it's just, it, it's really a, it's a, it's a, it's a really tough situation, I think, um, with where everything's headed. The difference with, with this open AI thing is that it's all supposed to be, freely available to everybody so that nobody no one particular entity is going to be able to capitalize on artificial intelligence once it starts becoming uh, much much more popular so if you want to contribute to hacker rank i i see no problem in that um well actually I, I do see a problem i raised the problem that i see in it i think that there's good and that there's bad i think that there's good and bad and anything that when we provide our content for free it would be ideal if we said you know what we provided so many of these comments whether it's Alexa or not Alexa, but Quora uh, or YouTube or Twitter or Facebook or any of these other sites. And if we put in all kinds of content and we're creating value for those companies that we should be able to share in some of that value that we're creating, almost like a BitTorrent, there should be some sort of currency or some sort of tracking system that basically says, you know, this guy, Chris Hawks, has contributed a lot to the web space, you know. Uh, we Like YouTube obviously makes money off my videos. They get 45% cut or something like that. Uh, but even beyond that, like like that's just the money that they're getting from the um, you know the actual you know the the companies that they're paying to market their products. There's like if you look at um, like if you do 450,000 views a month, only a small fraction of that is actually views that are getting ads put on them. Most of that other stuff, YouTube is just freely you know displaying to anybody for absolutely free, so the content creator doesn't get anything. Um, YouTube's obviously getting something out of it because they're providing a service, you know, something that people are eating up and, 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 and watching and stuff like that. So it's a, it, I don't know that there's a solution to this problem, though. I don't, um, and I don't even know that it's really a problem. But other people have raised this. The fact that companies are able to grab a monopoly basically on data and then, you know, use that where, you know, now smaller companies aren't able to compete because they don't have access to the uh, sheer amounts of, of data that, that the larger companies do and that they can only provide a better product through innovation which can easily be copied and stolen in this digital age so i could talk about this probably for hours but i'm going to go ahead and cut the video off now since uh, i'm approaching 15 minutes and i know you guys a lot of you guys um, don't like uh, too long of videos all right guys take care man have a good night bye